Hello and welcome everybody, I am OneProp Bavarian and today I have the ultimate guide to Crusader Kings 3 just for you. I have thought about how to approach the topic of a beginner's guide for a long time and think that this one will help players coming from CK2 and players completely new to the genre. Instead of dumping information about the interface on you that might not even be accurate anymore with upcoming patches and that you will most likely forget within hours, I want to give you a good understanding of the CK3 mindset that will allow you to explore the rest of the UI and game entirely on your own without having to be frustrated by it. CK3 is the paradox game with the best UI designed by far, but it can still understandably give trouble to new players. I would advise playing the in-game tutorial before or after the video, seeing as it is quite good to show you basic actions you can take in the game. Now, while the main chunk of this video will focus on putting you into the Crusader King's mindset and showcasing it, there are some basic interface topics we need to establish first. Let's start out with some very simple conditions, settings and game rules. In the settings, I highly advise to change the tooltip lock in to an action lock. This way you can lock in a tooltip immediately when it pops up by clicking your middle mouse button instead of having to wait, speeding up your time spent reading them. When it comes to the game rules, feel absolutely free to play around with the difficulty settings. There is no shame at all in making things a bit easier for yourself while you are learning, but do consider slowly getting rid of the crutches as you go. Beyond the difficulty rules, there are a number of settings I would recommend if you are interested in achieving a more believable world that develops around you organically as you play. I would suggest limited exclave independence, strict regional heresies, significantly slower culture conversion and slower faith conversion speeds, restricted diplomatic range, and the euro requirements on. Now with the pre-game preparation out of the way, choose your character in 867 or 1066, we are going to choose Duke Otto II of Bavaria and you can play along if you want to, and let's get into the mindset of a crusader king or queen. There are two basic ground rules that I want to lay down and that you need to follow when playing the game. These are the biggest things that you need to know to be successful. The first one is be your character. The second one is trust the issue tab. When it comes to the first one, you always need to keep in mind that Crusader Kings 3 is of course a game about conquest and grand strategy, but the game functions much more than that as a story generator, an open RPG in the truest sense of the word. The first thing you should do whenever starting a new game or after you die and are now playing as a different character is check who your character really is. You can see their traits, skills, their religion and culture in their character sheet. To play Crusader Kings 3 means to play into strengths of your character while avoiding their weaknesses, much like in real life of course. If you want more information about what any of these icons mean, simply hover over them and explore the tooltips that open with it. You will encounter an incredible variety of traits, religions and cultures as you play, so make sure to look at new things whenever they come up. Any decision that you take going forward will be a good one if you commit to the personality that you can observe within your character. It would also make it so that you will naturally explore different playstyles. This brings us directly to the second part of the Be Your Character formula. Every character you play will have the opportunity to dive into the game's perk trees that will give you powerful bonuses and grow your character's power as they age. I could be giving you a long introduction to the trees and which ones are the best, but the truth is that this introduction will be entirely useless whenever the trees get rebalanced and scrambled in patches that are bound to happen, so instead I want to encourage you to explore them yourselves as they are fit for your character. When you have a character like my Bavarian Duke here for example that is excellent at diplomacy, he will pick up diplomacy experience much faster than anything else. Playing into his strengths is incredibly useful. You don't need to finish a tree if you're not interested in the remaining perks of this character, so you can be quite flexible about it as well. All of these decisions have to be based on the life situation of your current character and what you think they really need. The theme of being on your feet and making decisions according to the needs of your character is one that can become a powerful tool of yours when playing the game. It would be futile to learn about the optimal strategy when specific circumstances of your character make certain things harder or easier. Always consider who you are and then make a choice. Now the second quintessential part of starting out in Crusader Kings 3 is the trust the issue tab formula. What I mean by that is the top section of your screen. Anything to the left of the numbered button is an urgent alarm or if you turned it on in the settings a general recommendation by the game that you will want to address as soon as possible. The numbered tab itself contains a variety of issues that range from opportunities, risks, small problems all the way to simple reminders to for example educate your children. I implore you to keep an eye on the issue tab in particular, primarily because it is an absolutely amazing tool that allows you to play the game while barely knowing the menus. How is this possible? Every time a new issue pops up and you click on it, it leads you directly to the very part of the menu that you need to address it. You can quickly pick up on where to find the most essential parts of the interface without having to manually find it. Mind you, the issue tab does not contain everything you might want to consider at any given moment, but it contains the bulk of it. Your realm, in most situations, will fare well if you climb through the different issues and decide which one you want to deal with. Check the menu occasionally and you are sure to lead a good life. 
Now that we have all of the basic mindset principles out of the way, let's actually take a look at what all of that means in practice. I will give you the necessary insight into parts of the UI we have not yet talked about that is required to kick off your game of CK3 smoothly. There will be parts that I will not talk about here, but that I will cover in more in-depth mechanics explanations. You do not need to know about them to start out in CK3 and come out of the gate strong, so I have decided to exclude them from this guide even though the information in them might be interesting. You can either learn about them yourself as you go or watch the upcoming videos about them here on the channel. Now, we are Duke Otto II of Bavaria. We are patient, ambitious and arrogant. While well, we mean no harm to anybody, of course, we view ourselves as the rightful ruler of all Bavaria. That is where the ambition and arrogance comes from. Our way of fighting will mostly be through the word as we are a seasoned diplomat with a high skill level. We already have enough children and a high enough diplomacy score, so we shall decide to focus on majesty in the focus tree. This will give us experience we can invest into any of the diplomacy trees, but in this case we are going to go down the August tree for those juicy bonuses that will complement our character and give us loads of prestige. Next, we are going to check our children and choose educators for them. At the age of 6, your children will automatically choose a childhood focus that fits their character, but you can change it until they become 9 if you want to. We are going to be educating our heir and our second born son ourselves to make sure they will come out great, and hand over our other children to people with a high learning skill and good character traits, since this will influence the personality our children will have. A high skill in the child's focus skill also helps a lot to give them a good education, and not just a mediocre one. I will also go ahead and marry or betroth all of our children already. This way we will gain alliances with powerful rulers all around us that can support us in our endeavors in case our meager military force isn't enough. I will not be investing in the military force since I need that money elsewhere and I'm a diplomat so I can make others fight for myself instead. After this it's time to check up on our council. Our council is made up by women and men we choose based on either their skill or if they are vassals on simply wanting them to like us. Practically all of the councillor's skills are useful but depend on your circumstances. When it comes to council missions, the thing we care most about right now, since we want to become the king of Bavaria, is that our bishop fabricates a claim for us in our home region. A claim can be pushed, so that we will then come in possession of the lands we went to war for. In this case, the northern duke of Nordgau is part of the same realm as us, and also in Bavaria. He is a vassal just like us of the Holy Roman Empire. If we were to declare war against him, he would not be protected by a common liege and would have to count on himself and his potential allies. This is a great target. Note the following. Fabricating a claim will cost money once your bishop has done his work. The higher his skill, the quicker will he be done with it. A good bishop will also have a chance to not just claim a county, but instead the entire duchy. That chance is what we are betting on. If we were to take the entire duchy of Nordgau, we would gain five whole provinces in our pursuit of the Bavarian crown. Next up, characters can undertake schemes towards others. You don't always have to have schemes running, but it is a good idea to at least check them out and see if you want to have them running. Usually you should use these schemes to win the hearts of the people your character cares for, or to arrange yourself favorably with your vassals so that they don't take hostile actions against you, like joining a faction that could tear your realm apart. Hostile schemes, on the other hand, are available so that you can harm those that otherwise don't want to be your friends. Our vassals are at the moment timid, however, and so we decide that we should rather win the favor of the Pope himself. Catholics in particular should be interested in a strong relationship with the Pope unless they plan to go against him. A well-liked Catholic can be granted money or even title claims by the Pope. We'll ignore hostile schemes for the moment since Otto is not interested in becoming a murderer and, quite frankly, he would not be good at it either. Now that we have done all this to prepare our grand storm onto the Kingdom of Bavaria, we can start the game and see where it goes. Every now and again you will gain events triggered by other characters or by your lifestyle or yourself just in general. Choose wisely. They can have negatives and positives, including stressing your character out or costing you money, prestige or piety. The more you act according to a character's personality, the less stress will you receive and the better life will be for you. That aside, when you have alliances you will sometimes be called into their wars as well. It is entirely up to you whether you want to aid them and it is most certainly not mandatory. The penalty for not aiding is merely a small loss in opinion. In this case, however, it is evident that the Hungarian rebellion is going to win against the Hungarian crown, so aiding our Hungarian ally will make them like us more and we know that we can win this war quickly. As you can see here, a bishop has fabricated a claim on a county, but that is of course not what we are after, since we want the duchy, so we will simply tell him to keep at it. You do not have to take the county claim, you can simply tell him to get back to it. Right here you can see an event that will allow me to progress my scheme to sway the Pope if I am willing to spend some money for it. In this case I will of course do it since my character doesn't mind spending money if it will bring him more success. The results can be seen immediately. We made the Pope like us enough to be willing to give us a claim on a duchy inside of Bavaria. He is willing to do this because he likes us so much and the Duke of Austria is a highly sinful ruler that ought to be ousted. 
We might not be religious, but this is certainly convenient. Asking for a title, however, will cost us piety that we have understandably very little of. You can gain piety by going on a pilgrimage, for example. If it is prestige you lack in comparison, hosting feasts can get you a good bump for that as well. Beyond these decisions, waging wars and, for example, having certain lifestyle perks will make the gain of either piety or prestige significantly easier. Now that we have been on the pilgrimage, we have gained the piety that we need to request a papal claim and head into the war. The allies we made earlier will aid us in this for a certain prestige cost. That is, of course, very much worth investing. Make sure to only call in as many as you need as to not let it get too costly. Wars are won logically on the battlefield and there are many things that factor into this. I have neglected to build any sort of specialized minute arms since I am simply counting on the quality of my allied troops. I will make warfare tutorials to show you the intricacies, but for starters you should know that if you are not in my position and have an infinite amount of allies, you should check your enemy's troop count in their character menu to see any minute arms they have and then build minute arms that counter them. That is the very basic of warfare. Again, we don't actually need to do that since our allies will bring massive numbers in our favor. It should also be pointed out that allied armies will only join you on the battlefield if they have no wars of their own. The AI will always prioritize resolving their own wars over yours. Make sure to attack strong enemies with strong allies when they are busy in another war for example and to only call in allies of yours that are not currently busy, otherwise they will be very much useless. If they are not busy, allied armies will hover around yours, siege with you and follow you into battle. The forces of Austria never stood a chance and so this is of course their demise. While the war for Austria is going on, our bishop finally managed to fabricate a claim on the entire duchy. While getting the claim costs a lot of money, it will be absolutely worth it. In CK3 you can push your own claims or those of others, but the most reliable way to gain them is most certainly via your bishop. And now after the war for Austria is over, it is time to press our claim for Nordgau. To complete the number of counties in Bavaria, we need to form the kingdom. The war is simple enough with our bohemian ally. This rapid expansion is of course great since we now merely need 500 gold to create the king tier title, but the rapid expansion also made it so that a number of counts want to see our realm split yet again by putting the former Duke of Austria onto his throne. As mentioned before, there are a variety of measures you can take to respond. Were they to rebel, our allies would also aid us in crushing them regardless, so our position is still very stable. In this case, we have however taken numerous prisoners in the last wars and so decide to simply sell them off, seeing as we hold no grudges against them personally, but need the money to be crowned king. With a kingdom formed, I can hand out the Duchy of Austria that the faction is all about to a different, cowardly vassal of ours. He is sure to never engage in warfare or rebellion against us, seeing as he is a coward, and the unruly counts are now his problem. Austria has been pacified and integrated into our crown. When you hold a title like Bavaria, your liege will soon send you an offer to hand over all vassals you have at a euro right on, completing your Bavarian collection. This is why if you are a vassal of an empire, it is very, very much worth going on to form a kingdom inside, since your liege will transfer anybody that is rightfully a vassal of yours right into you. Remember, the rise by using our allied forces was only possible since our character excelled in it and I focused on it. Whatever your character's strengths are, focus on them. An intrigue, martial, learning or stewardship focused character could and should focus on a different way to rise up, such as building up their own army so that they can win their own wars, or murdering others so that they may inherit certain titles, and so on. There is an infinite ways of playing this game and of succeeding in it. The only way to lose it is truly if you do not play into the strengths of your character. By playing into the strengths and weaknesses of your character, and by going on to trust the issue tab and check it every now and again, you are ready to dive into Crusader Kings 3 and forge your own legacy. I hope that this video was indeed enough to now let you start out in Crusader Kings 3 on your own. I will be doing more Crusader Kings 3 tutorial videos going forward. Next up is the military and warfare aspect so that you will be successful as a war-minded character. However, I most certainly believe that if you roleplay your character and trust the issue tab, you already have a pretty good shot. Now, I would like to thank the members of the channel that are making videos such as this one possible. Thank you all for becoming members and supporting the channel directly. Thank you very much. Later, Alligator.